All right. Oh, that's loud. Okay. Levels are good. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name's Sean Daig. I've been involved in OpenStack for the last five years um, at IBM at the moment. Um, I'm going to talk about today large scale changes in OpenStack and some um, patterns of being successful in them. A recurring topic that's come up time and time again. Um, at various summits over the last few years is, you know, like I've sort of figured out how to get a thing changed in one project and get engaged with that project, but the moment we start talking about doing something, you know, across a couple projects or like broader in general, um, I people just run out of steam, fall over, it doesn't work, not sure why. Um, and the postmortem process is like not entirely clear, like how could we do that better? And the thing is, we have actually done a bunch of these in the past. There are patterns of success. Um, I'm going to talk about those. I'm going to get us there. Um, and I'm going to do it by starting on one of these problems that we solved over the last couple of years. So it always feels better to start with a story, story of success, um, when I banged my head into a thing and then we figured out how to go forward. Um, so a year ago, this was my problem. Um, three years ago, we implemented this thing called API microversions within Nova, and it quickly spread between a bunch of other projects. They replicated what we were doing. Um, that's great. I've been in the field for two years. There's actually like literally no documentation about how to use it. In order to use it, you had to get inside the Nova source code um, and find this document, which is kind of buried in an odd place. Um, and that explains, in pretty reasonable detail, like changes that we had made. Um, but that was not like part of the API reference, which was this nice pretty page which tells you, uh, you know, what you can do with various OpenStack APIs. Um, and this is what it looked like at the time. Thank you, Wayback Machine. Um, so, okay. So that's cool. This like looks actually pretty good and I can, you know, these, uh, these blue things are collapsible sections because it's actually a lot of information and expands out. Um, how do I get the details about the fact that we added like a couple new fields into this document? Um, I go through this, which is SGML. Um, yeah, so we had this, documentation system that was built uh, because we had a lot of technical editors that um, understood DocBook. DocBook's cool. DocBook's super structured if you're really familiar with it, but it's really a specific language that documentation editors know. And then they figured out that um, there was this emerging standard called Waddle that Sun proposed in 2009, but kind of let die on the vine, which was an XML markup of REST interfaces which is like, you know, method calls and craziness. And then this was auto-converted into compatible SGML that was included in SGML documents and, you know, sad. Um, fortunately, I was not the only person that ran into the fact that this was massively inhibiting us from having accurate documentation because uh, just to make changes was crazy. Um, so there was already an existing effort that had started a year before I even ran into my problem. Um, there's this thing called Swagger, which is now called OpenAPI. So this is a new like, emerging standard of how do we document REST APIs, except it's not actually how do we document REST APIs. It's a way to describe and design them. Looks like this. Okay, it's JSON. You know, we like JSON. Um, not a bunch of random brackets everywhere, but it's very prescriptive, and um, it prescribes, like, it, it describes an API in a way that a machine would deal with it. Um, and it has certain features within it. And then when it kind of gets to its edges, right, like everything, you know, it can only describe a certain amount of the problem space, like, oh, well, you can, you can add extensions to it. Um, but that was the problem when we started to look at what the OpenStack APIs and start doing real worked examples, 
the, we couldn't, there were two things that completely fell down. One, microversions, which was the thing I was actually trying to solve for. Um, but even without that, there's this actions interface that exists in a bunch of OpenStack um, that meant we had to add these really crazy extension points. Um, the net of which meant that like, of the 12 documented at the time services, only seven of them could uh, pass those two barriers. Doesn't actually mean that Swagger would work for them for other reasons, but, but they already couldn't work within well-defined Swagger seven out of 12. Seven out of 12 is not a success story, um, especially when the, those seven are the most complicated ones that we have to really describe interesting things with. Um, you know, and just like think about it another way, right? Like when you buy into a community or a standard like Swagger, like if you actually buy into it and stay within its box, you, you gain an ecosystem, right? You gain an ecosystem of authoring tools, to build stuff to build websites, automatic clients. The moment you start breaking out of that box, you lose the ecosystem. All the tooling and all of the great things that you got from being part of that ecosystem, like we have now forked, we don't get to do any of that. We need these things, which means not only did we sign up for this, but we signed up for writing everything. Um, and given this is already understaffed effort, like, this was not a path forward. Um, so there's kind of three things you need to have a successful effort in OpenStack, right? You need like some shared understanding of the problem that you were doing, a clear indication of who your stakeholders are and that they're all bought onto it, and then a plausible promise that like, yep, everyone believes that with with these people signed on to this thing, we're gonna get it done, which means I will put effort, I will help and not get in the way. Um, you know, shared understanding, right? No matter how smart you are and how much you think you understand about what any part of OpenStack does, the answer is you don't have it all in your head um, for any non-trivial piece of code. Um, and you know, great, I wanna go solve a problem, that's cool, this is the bit I understand. Maybe there's other people that understand pieces that are the same as mine, we might be talking in a similar language, but realistically, there's a lot of other people that like see this thing from a completely different perspective. Um, and in doing so, you know, this communication gap becomes very real. You know, this is, people often describe this as seeing different parts of the elephant, right? Like some of it looks like a tree and some of it looks like a rug and some of it, you know, looks like a snake, but um, without that common, you know, wor when words don't mean the same thing, there's no way you can make forward progress. Um, and, you know, as you're getting your stakeholders, the other thing, people kind of forget this sometimes, right? Like, things only get done when people do them. You know, the abstract concept of Nova doesn't get something done. Things get done because Riedemann gets grumpy and says like, this has to be done by Friday, otherwise, you know, whatever, right? So, um, and that there was support all along the way. Um, because in OpenStack, you know, nothing, nothing gets done without, you know, two or three people, someone writing patches and, and a couple of people reviewing them. Um, so, so again, like every effort needs clear stakeholders, right? Who's doing the work, who, who needs to approve that work? As you know, it might just be reviewers. Um, who's going to be impacted by this? Because it might be people unrelated to the doing the work and and approving the work. Um, and even more importantly, who hates this idea? Because there's various reasons why people come up and become the opposition. Um, and most of them are not because they're terrible people. Most of them are because they have a different understanding of the thing or they have a piece of information you don't have about what this might hurt down the road. Um, and you know, it's important not to fear your resistance but actually dive straight into that. Like, okay, 
I get you don't like this. I want to you know, make sure I at least understand where that's coming from and really, really get that feedback back in. Uh, otherwise, I don't think we can build like a real solution for you. Um, plausible promise. This is a thing that Clay Shirky talks about um, in a bunch of his books about building online communities that, <coughs> you know, really at the end of the day, you know, a community like Wikipedia, for instance, right? There, there are a few people that are like deeply invested, spending a ton of their time on it, but there's also lots of little efforts that help or hinder along the way. And whether or not people are going to spend these little chunks of time is whether or not they believe you have a plausible promise that like the thing that you want to do, like we've gotten the general agreement, you figured out who the stakeholders are, um, we have a clear idea of where we would get to eventually, we have a clear idea of a next step which is useful on its own because if this thing doesn't become useful until 17 steps down the road. Like, there's lots and lots of reasons why we will never get there. But if every step is incrementally useful, that like adds to the plausibility of how we move forward. Um, and like, do you have some way of even knowing? Like, we have this goal that we're trying to get to. Like, do we have any way of knowing how to get there, or that we're getting any closer? Um, so. So if we look at the effort at hand, the effort that I ran into is like, I have this problem, okay, someone's already tried to solve this problem, except this, this has been kind of circling for a year. Like, why was it circling for a year, right? Like, was there this shared understanding about what the problem we were trying to solve? Because the, the, from my perspective, the real issue, the, the consumer of API documentation is not machines, it's people. Swagger was really good at making it consumable for machines, which was not actually the problem we had. Also, it didn't really fit with the stuff we had. Like the worked examples kind of avoided the hard problems um, to get something working, but like didn't quite like look for like you know try to test are we going to break down really quickly. Um, it was happening a little bit in a corner. Um, and right, it just the, the plausibility problem. Um, now, granted, when they got started, microversions kind of got started at the same time, so that was a blind spot where we just didn't see each other, right? And so, like, that's fine. Um, no, you know, no fault of anyone there. But but the actions thing had been there a long time, and like the mapping definitely didn't raise quite enough red flags. Like, okay, so. Maybe, you know, we're circling for a year, we're not making progress, what do we need to do? Like, let's step back and like, think of a new effort. Like, what is, what is, what are we actually trying to accomplish? Like, what do we need, right? You know, what are our big inhibitors? Is our, our doc format, this SGML craziness, is like, it's a new thing for contributors to learn, it's too hard, it is impeded people coming into the process. Um, there was a you know a thing I didn't realize until I started like getting on Google Hangouts with Ann Gentle and like, what do you think your concerns are? And one of them was the current look and feel was something that um, the API docs teams were really invested in. And it's like okay that's cool, that's a thing I didn't realize that we had within our set of constraints. Like, how do we make sure we replicate that with whatever we put behind it? The micro version support. I needed, um, you know, who who were our actual uh, contributors, right? The API, so there there was a docs team, there was an API sub team of that. It was a very small group of people. They were definitely not keeping up on the API front. So in order for us to make forward progress, we also had to get all the project teams. Like, what would we do that would get you bought in so that you would maintain your documents? Um, what does the doc team need that means that it merges well with what the rest of what they've got? And just remembering that we're communicating to humans, that's really important, which means we need to be able to put like long form pros of explaining what concepts are within here, which buried inside of triply nested JSON objects is a little bit funny to figure out how that like comes out. And then it was, okay, so, so maybe we've got one and two, um, 
and we got to come up with like what what is our plausible promise path forward. And this whole process was like a couple, like a few weeks of me being like, oh, you know, starting with, I will do the swagger thing. This is great. Okay, like show me some examples. And I started going through. And I'm like, wait, we can't do this, and we can't do that. And I get on the on a hangout with Anne. I'm like, I think I found some problems with the, the you know, the the path of record. And I kind of walked them through with her, and she's like, yeah, but, but like we've been doing this for a while, like, like we really can't, like we really can't just like throw this under the bus now. I'm like, okay. And then like a couple days go by, we get back on the phone. So I found these other problems, I'm like well, and you know, we went back and forth, I think over the course of two weeks we were on video four times, and like over the course of it, like when I got her feedback and like understood what her concerns were and made sure they got integrated, and it's like, okay, how about I go and try something and I will come back and see if you hate it. So, I gotta build a custom Sphinx extension. Um, why was that ever the solution, right? This is, this is code I've never written, this is an area I've never touched, it's, you know, I hunt around, Doug Hellman has written like 10% of all the custom Sphinx extension code in the world, and I start asking him questions like, yeah, I don't know how that work, part works, I don't know how that part works. Like, okay, right, so um, deep in the bowels of craziness. However, this is, you know, like a human readable, editable format that turns into this. And, you know, so like, where me and a couple other people got burdened by figuring out how to build all the little bits that turn this into that. Um, you know, there's actually, there's a little more structure in here than is maybe obvious, right? This is a structured element and it means a real thing. Um, these, uh, because there's a certain amount of repetitiveness in like, you know, the definition of what an ID is, um, we have a lookup table where a lot more information can be provided. Um, and, you know, examples. Examples are huge, right? Like, I want to know what's on the wire. Um, so, so that's cool. Um, we got the look and feel. Uh, I, I had a first pass on this. This is live, what's out there today. Um, and then uh, Muggsy, who knew how to do a bunch of things in JavaScript that I didn't know how to do, would, would, built on what I had. And it's like, oh, we do this and this and this and this and this and this and bam, okay. Um, it looks surprisingly like the old site. Um, so in, in our testing, like, like are we gonna get to our end goal was basically, okay, we're gonna do this thing and we're doing it inside the Nova tree so that if we screw it up, like we haven't, we haven't thrown anyone else under the bus yet, like that's just my wasted time um, and if, we, uh, if it's successful, we'll extract this as a pattern and let other people do it. Um, and the reality was uh, it got a little more successful a little quicker than we were hoping for, wherein everyone started copying all the code out of the Nova tree and putting it in their tree because they wanted to get here faster. And so, um, so once we had about 12 projects already doing the new system, I had like, all right, let me get all this bundled up and like get it, you know, clean everything up so that um, we don't completely fork the problem. Um, so, you know, in, it wasn't, this was not in some ways, a, yeah, you wanna throw a question? RST or it's RST, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, the details of this, which could be a whole other talk about the craziness involved in there, uh, Sphinx, which is the thing that converts RST to many different formats into man pages, into web pages, into just straight up text, um, has a mechanism by which you plug in parser extensions and stanzas and you can, you can hook and change many interesting parts of the entire rendering pipeline um, and, uh, and that's what this is. Um, it, not exactly. You have to have this thing registered. Um, but we do in all our, our documentation trees. Um, 
So, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'll kind of look at a few other examples of efforts I've been involved in that have sometimes been successful and sometimes not, right? Um, one of which was uh, policy and code. So we had a big, wanted to do a big change within the OpenStack patterns. We have these policy.json files. They're everywhere. They have lots of crypticness in them. They're their own defined DSL. Um, and when we make API changes, you need a new one. Otherwise, you might open security holes on you during upgrade, which is just craziness, right? It's a bunch of state that doesn't need to be there. Um, so in the Nova team, we got this idea like, you know what, we should totally do this in code. Like all the defaults are in code that we could run with an empty policy file. The only thing you would change is the stuff you're overriding, which means if we bring in a new interface, like you, by default, you're getting a sane like level of protection. Um, so, great. Who do we need to get a shared vision of this? Who are the stakeholders? Um, we need the Nova team. We actually had a bunch of operator buy-in as to like, oh yeah, that would totally make life easier. We also need the Keystone team bought in. Um, but this is one of those places where the Keystone team was in the middle of trying to do a much more complicated thing with policy from a completely different angle. Um, and after, you know, uh, I started with, okay, I'm sure that I can like have some high-level conversations with the Keystone folks and they will be able to uh, kind of help me translate this to what it means there. And it, it turns out our understanding was so radically different of the problem space that is policy that we were never communicating. You know, I ended up having to go read a lot more of the Keystone policy code before I could even start speaking a common language and then they had a different set of concerns that were coming from a different direction, trying to do a different big project. And so the whole thing, um, I probably should have put the mailing list thread where the whole thing just blew up into nothingness and it was like everyone walked away. Like, okay, that's no good. But even in failures, you can have elements of success, right? Because part of the problem, you know, the problem we ran into was this shared understanding. Like we weren't on the same page. The way to work towards getting on the same page was uh, for me, for, from a very different perspective to go in and read a lot more about what their thing was and start to digest it and re-explain that to start building a common basis to move forward. That by itself moves the ball forward even though the entire effort collapsed and everyone went ragey away. Um, it was still a good idea. Because the ball got moved forward, a year later, Andrew Lasky was like, you know, we really should do that. I'm like, go for it. Um, you know, we've passed the baton. He decided to go and take and charge it. Um, and like, that's super cool. We'd like set a new baseline. We had a new conversation with all the Keystone folks in the room. All of a sudden there was a lot more cross understanding of concerns. And we just like stamped, um, like, yeah, we'd totally just get that done. Um, that was in Austin. Um, and then and it was off in the races, right? So like all our stakeholders were there. There was a plausible path through the Oslo, you know, here's a set of Oslo policy changes and Nova changes. Um, but also, like really importantly, and the thing that we forget a lot, right, that it this took a lot of project management to get it through these multiple teams. So when this went forward, I was like, I am too burned out to actually help on the tech side of this particular problem, but I will help you project management. So you like you tell me like the things that you you need to get landed in all these various points, and I will just keep chasing reviewers for you. Um, and so that's what I did. Is like I would like check in with Lasky like you know at least once a week, if not more often. It's like okay, like you know we got these Basel policy bits that aren't in there yet. Let's go chase reviewers. Let's go chase reviewers. Um, who do I need? Who's all the right people to find to line up on this? you know, pin down Dims and Doug and Steve Martinelli and like, you guys gotta do this. Um, and it got through, it was in. And now uh, Keystone's actually putting the same thing back into uh, their defaults, which is super nice. Um, this is the title of an OpenStack spec. You never wanna see a title of a spec um, end with the question mark. Um, that 
that leads to the point that we clearly don't have an understanding of this, right? There was a big push a couple of years ago um, that like eventlet is terrible, and okay, that's fine, eventlet's terrible, um, and so we should replace it. Okay, but like with what? Like, and why is it terrible? And why is every other solution not equally as terrible, right? Like, just because you know there's a great unknown which is, doesn't have you know, like all the piles of garbage that you've got in front of you does not mean it's actually a better place to be. Um, and even if it was, how long is it going to take to get there? And what is the other cost along the way? Um, and an effort of this scale, like I, I applaud people for being um, enthusiastic about big efforts, but like literally this is everything has to change all at once. And that just, it just can't work, right? Like it just doesn't, doesn't match up. Um, so things like that, it's just like, you know, you didn't have any of, any of the things lined up. Um, Glance, Glance is kind of an interesting one, right? Glance has been trying to get rid of the V1 API for a long time. Um, and again, this was an effort that circled for a very long time. Like I remember starting to have these conversations back in 2014. Um, and eventually you just kind of wonder like, okay, four cycles, we keep talking about like even just in the Nova path, like why hasn't this code landed yet? What's missing? Um, and that there was a, there's a total breakdown in the shared understanding, like from, from the glance team side, it's like, oh, you just gotta use this other interface. It's like, well, do you understand our concerns about the fact that we currently proxy your interface out? And like that kind of breaks the experience. Like this, there's just new things and the, the way that the interface works, we can't honor the old one. Um, and you know, what does the upgrade path look for an operator to s go across this? The Nova team was pretty deep in like, we need to have a deprecation upgrade cycle that makes us all sensible. Um, and Zen. If everyone's ever looked at the Zen BERT driver, it does very interesting things and interesting for you know, like many asterisks after it. Um, and the moment you show up and say like, I've got this idea, it's like, well, what, have you looked at the Zen case yet? And if people haven't, it's like, okay, go back into your homework first. You know, I, I get there's a small percentage of our users, but it's supported in tree code. We can't just not do it. Um, so, you know, the Glance team, like, was doing a, a bunch of good work, but they, were, they had not kind of gotten the stakeholders aligned on this. Um, and because of which, like, there was no, like, path that made any sense here. Um, so after about, like, four cycles of this, um, we got, there was, at the end, there was a big push at the end of one release, and it was just like, it was going in and like some crazy patches were being thrown together. Like, okay, just like, let's stop and like reevaluate, answer all these questions, and we'll move forward. Um, and let's not rush the release on it. So basically, we stopped it for the release. Um, one of the Glance team members went back, wrote a beautiful doc that actually addressed every single one of these things. Like, what is the answer to that? And it's like, that's perfect. Like, all of a sudden, you've like painted the picture of, of where we're headed. All, all of the hard problems have been pseudo worked. And like, now we are all exactly on the same page about how this happens. And so, over the course of four weeks, we landed all the patches and cut Nova over. Um, it was only four weeks of work once we got on this page. And that's the important thing. Um, and so I will kind of wind in on my, my hopeful one. This is kind of the end of it. This is one that's right now. Um, out of the Atlanta PTG, we got this, you know, hierarchical quotas have been a thing people have been talking about for like three years at least. And there's, you know, there's keystone support for building the structure of hierarchy of projects, but that like, doesn't mean any of the projects actually do anything with it. Um, so, so, and it was very clear in this Atlanta PGG section that a big part of the problem is we just didn't have a shared understanding. You had a whole bunch of people saying the word overbooking and meaning slightly different things, right? And then realizing that the moment we started having a conversation about like, what do hierarchical quotas mean? Everyone wanted to discuss exactly like the algorithm by which the following, and it's like, no, that's not actually, it turns out like we can dive into a rabbit hole really quickly, 
and talk about like, well, if you did this, then the following things would happen. Can we at least like get a shared scope of the problem? Um, and there were some threads of that there. So I, I ran at, um, we built just a concept spec, which we put, which is landed in the Keystone project, which is, this is the general scope of the problem. This is the general class of things that we want to do. This is a concrete set of things we're going to do is we're going to move limits definitions into Keystone, which has the project hierarchy, because it turns out that validating the project hierarchy is saying is actually one of the hard problems. And then here's some kind of like pseudo steps on the next path forward. Um, and that's out, that's landed. We had buy-in from like the CERN guys are like, this is great. Like this is totally, you know, works for a bunch of things. We had um, Dean representing kind of the client experience, like, yeah, that's exactly like running around to 17 different projects to figure out how I tip up someone's quota so they can actually boot a server is not really an effective way to do that. Um, and in landing that concept spec, it was, okay, the Keystone folks, the first changes are there, so we're gonna go there first, but you know, we have to at least get buy-in from all the core infrastructure, right? Like, Nova, Neutron, Cinder, Glance, PTLs all had to sign on to this before we moved it forward and actually engage them early. And, you know, and like the only thing that got even like kind of a twinge was like, all right, well, just remember this volume types case, like, but I think it fits in this model. Um, and we have a part of a path going forward. We have some more detailed work to be done on this, but like, for the first time in three years, we seem to be making progress on a thing which is gonna to touch a whole bunch of OpenStack. And a big part of it is like, you know, fit into this model, right? You know, build your shared understanding, build that forward, make sure you've got the right stakeholders and that you've got some plausible promise that you're going to get there. Um, with that, I'm gonna end. We have seven minutes for questions. Um, and if anyone would like to ask one, please jump to the mic. And we have no questions, that's okay too, but, yeah. Can you, can you articulate a case where things did not work or, you know, something went so horribly wrong that uh, stands out? Um, I mean, the event, the, <laughs> if you go look at the OpenStack Spectre repository, that's about 90% of what's in there. Um, we had this really, uh, when the, uh, when, when specs as a concept move forward, it was this really great idea that projects would have a way that people could propose new ideas, we could work out the details in Garrett. And then someone's like, well, there's certain things we wanna do all across OpenStack, and like, we'll have an OpenStack Specs repository, which, you know, at the time seemed like a good idea, but many things got proposed there, like, like define distributed lock management across all of OpenStack, like change eventlet to something else, Rearchitect the world, right? So, like, they were these big, giant scope problems that had step one, write an OpenStack spec, step two, step three, profit. Like, it was just, th there was no, no progression, and there was an assumption by people that were pushing these things in there that, like, oh, the OpenStack specs repository is the magic button by which like everyone important signs onto a thing and work gets done. But you have to make a distinction between who is the approved list in Garrett and who are the important people that are signed off on a thing to get it done. They are not necessarily the same set, you know. Um, so that, that's, <clears throat> you know, we've, got, we've still got eventlet. We're gonna have eventlet for a long time. The eventlet thing, that being said, right, the like, all the conversations we had in that had a piece of productivity out of it, which was, um, you know, our API servers are running as eventlet WSGI stacks, which is kind of terrible and not really good fitting into people's production deployments. Like, we, should, we could solve that bit. Um, and you see as a, you know, two, three years later, we've got community-wide goals of everyone's API services need to be served off of real, like, UWSGI or Apache um, over the next cycle. 
um, to and and it's actually pulling some bugs out in the process. Um, so yeah, so that's an instance instances where things went wrong and some lessons we learned out of them. How do you manage teams that are silos and when you propose these you know new changes, they're just there's total uh, advert to it. Now, it seemed like from the from the your experience with the with the policy change in, in Keystone, it was kind of kind of by sheer luck that I, that 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 a year later someone else picked up the baton and, and got it through. I mean, what, what what are some tips besides the ones you've shared with us today? Sure. For for for, for, for those kind of edge cases. Yeah, yeah, no. Um things that definitely from the outside people don't quite think about how distinctive uh, regionalized cultures grow up inside of every project, right? As well as understanding, right? OpenSec is enormous. There's so much to learn there. Um, so the biggest thing that I found is like actually um, super useful is uh, when you have some high level idea, right? Mistake I made on the policy thing the first time was like, and I kind of knew I was making the mistake at the time, but it was just a, a factor of time, right? The first thing you have to do is actually go do your homework deep in whatever it is, right? There was a set of words, there was a set of concerns. I just, like didn't actually didn't understand why the things they were really concerned about were concerns. And part of that was I was did not understand enough of their project. I just like was missing a whole bunch of things. So um, if you are going to go and dive hard at a thing in somebody's community, like you have to go do your homework. You have to go and read a bunch of their source code and understand like, hmm, this isn't the way I thought it used to work. Um, and in doing so, and, and also being like, hey, I'm just gonna ask some stupid questions, like can you guys help me out, right? Like that, that helps also build relationship with all those folks. I mean, I had like very decent relationship with a bunch of the Keystone team, but we just, we weren't talking the same language um, you know, they, they did not, it took a while for them to envision why we would ever want to do the thing that we're doing. Um, and part of it is this, they, their API doesn't change as much as ours does. Um, and so their concerns were different. Um, but yeah, just in general, right? Like go run to your homework right now. I'm working through, um, we're reviving global, uh, request ID chaining so that like the request ID will be the same from Nova to you glance to Neutron when you make the call outs, right? Which is a thing that was like the first attempt on that was four years ago. And there were a few reasons why that fell down at the time, but in reviving it, it's also like, you know, like here's exactly the flow that's happening. And there's like, actually, so we have to make changes in four projects, but they're actually really small and it's, like pack, unpack it all now, right? I spent a lot of time reading middleware over the last 48 hours, and it's like, oh, that didn't work how I thought it worked. Okay, but the solution's actually not that far away, so um, yeah, do your homework. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? All right, well thank you all. We are at lunch. Um, enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>